All right, what we're going to talk about today is a topic that um, is kind of interesting because it's, it's one of those topics that um, might kind of surprise you in coming, right, in that um, we've, we've looked before in this class at what happens with members that are being stressed axially, right? And we've kind of identified two different ways that members can be stressed axially. They can either be put in tension, which is a force that tries to make a member longer, or they can be put in compression, which is a force that tries to make a member shorter, right? And, you know, we're comfortable with that, I think. And we're also, I think, generally comfortable with the idea that most materials have roughly the same yielding strength in tension as well as in compression. And so we're, uh, I would say most of us are probably comfortable with this idea that members can fail in compression by getting up to a yielding strength of that material. And, and once it gets up to that amount of stress in the material that's equal to the yielding strength, then we would say it would fail. But what I'm going to show you today is that that's not the only way that compressive members can fail. And so by way of introduction here, I thought I would actually bring in something and show you a different kind of compressive failure, right? So you see actually a little picture of what I'm about to do physically right there. What if you have what, you know, by everyone's eye should look like about a straight rod right there, and you take it and you put it in the jaws of a pair of pliers like this, something along these lines, right? So there you've got a member right there. What happens if I start squeezing these handles? Okay. Yeah, any force I put in these handles with my hand, what's going to happen here? It's going to compress it. It's going to put compressive stress into this little member right here. It's going to try to make it shorter. Not only that, but I would say just based on the ratios of certain lengths right here on this pair of pliers, it looks like that member is probably going to experience even more force on its ends than what I'm putting in my hand on the handles. Okay. Now, if the only thing that we had to go on was the idea that this member could reach its yielding strength, then the failure should look like this, okay? It should look like the member getting a little bit shorter and being that way permanently, right? It should get a little bit shorter and it should stay that way. And that would be what a yielding failure would look like for a compressive member like this. Do you think that's what it's gonna do, okay? partly based on the picture that you see up there on the screen. But if I start squeezing on this, what just happened? OK, you see there, the thing didn't stay in a straight line like it started out, right? Instead, the middle of it sort of kicked out to one side. And that was with a member that I tried to make sure this member was about as straight as it could possibly be. Now, you couldn't probably feel this, but I, you can probably imagine what that felt like just now for me to squeeze those handles, right? What happened was, and I'll, you know, I'll pick a, I've got a new piece right here. What happens is when you start to squeeze the handles, right, with a little piece in there, you can put quite a bit of force on those handles and you don't feel it give at all, right? I can, I can keep squeezing this more and more and more and more and more and more. And right now, I'm, I'm increasing the amount of force in my hands. You'll have to believe me, right? But then what happens? At some point, right, I get up to that critical amount of force that it takes. And once I get up to that level, the thing buckles. And so what I'm going to try to do today is present the theory behind figuring out what that critical force is that you can put on the ends of a member like this where it will exhibit this behavior as opposed to just yielding and compression. OK, does that sound good? So um, let's talk very first thing here about two different kinds of equilibrium, because this is actually kind of important here. Um, and you may have heard these terms before, but I'll, re I'll review them in case you have. Uh, first of all, stable equilibrium. The idea with either stable or unstable equilibrium is that uh, if you were to disturb the system from where it is, the question is, will the forces that are then seen in the system try to put it back to where it started? Or will the disturbance that you did in the system actually make it have even more displacement from where it started before you had the disturbance? And so I'm showing you two different examples here. Yeah, you, can, you might think of this thing as kind of like a pendulum. If the pendulum is hanging down, right? and you were to then 
like just nudge it ever so slightly, right? You just put some tiny little force to one side and then let go of that force again, okay? What's gonna happen with that pendulum? Okay, yeah, it'll, it might move a little bit, but when you let go of it, what will happen? It just kind of moves back to the beginning point. Not super interesting, right? It'll just, it'll, re, it'll basically return itself to where it started, okay? Now, what about the other pendulum that starts out in equilibrium because its center of gravity is directly over the top of the pin, right? So there's nothing that would be acting on this body that would be trying to, you know, rotate it right, for that, for that other body that I'm showing there. There's nothing on there that's going to be trying to make it rotate because the CG is directly above the pin. But what would happen in this case if I gave it some gentle little nudge, tiny little force right there, okay? As soon as it got moved a little bit over to one side, now where is its CG located? No longer directly over the top of the pin, and so now what happens? Yeah, now it's inducing a moment on that piece that's in that same direction, right? The difference between that and the previous one is that, yes, in the stable equilibrium case, by moving it over to the side a little bit, it also induced a moment in that one due to the weight acting on the CG, but the moment was in the direction that tried to make it go back to where it started. With this one, the moment, once I give that a little nudge and move the CG over away from the, the center point of this thing, it's going to now want to continue to go the same direction that I pushed it. And so this is an example of unstable equilibrium because all it takes is a little bit little nudge there and it's, it's not going to stop. It's just going to keep on rotating around and it'll fall down. So we're, we're kind of comfortable with this. So why does this matter? Well, let me kind of you know, draw the analogy here to what happens with, uh, with axially loaded members, okay? So here is an axially loaded member. Okay, we've seen these before. Okay, and in this case, let me show a, a, you know, something that's loaded in tension, right? I've got this little tension load acting on here. Okay, and what would happen, you know, since this is a real material that has elasticity to it, let's say that I'm loading it like this and then, you know, some mischievous person came over and nudged it in the middle and caused it to not be perfectly straight anymore. Right? They did that and then they let go again. What happens with that tensile member? Okay. Yeah, the forces tend to straighten it back out. If it does have a little bit of disturbance off of being perfectly straight, the forces applied tend to try to pull it back straight again. Right? What happens in the case of compression? Most of you probably know where I'm going with this. Okay, if you've got a compressive member here where these two forces are along the same exact line of action, right, this member's got enough strength to it that when you put that load on it, at least if it's not too big, the member will withstand that force acting in the middle of it, okay? But let's say that it's right on the verge, right? It's got, it's got a lot of force in it right there, and now someone... Uh, comes along and adds a little force to one side right in the middle so that it actually causes the middle to flex out just a little bit. Okay, what happens now? Okay, if you think about this, it, you know, I'll, I'll actually sketch it just a little bit. It's now coming out to the side just a little tiny bit, right? What that does is that these forces that act on the ends now induce a bending moment because that member is no longer straight, right? It wasn't really inducing a bending moment before because the line of action went right through the middle of it. But now it's inducing a bending moment in this piece because there's a difference between where the line of action is of this force and where the member's center is up there, where the, the uh, neutral axis would be of it flexing. And so that's going to basically cause there to be more of a bending moment in that part. And so, you know, as if that F is fairly large, then what happens is as soon as that starts to move out just a little bit, the thing will collapse, okay? So the reason why compressive members are of particular interest to us here is that they represent a case of unstable equilibrium in a sense, whereas tensile members are a state of, of stable equilibrium, okay? So 
that's kind of all the background that I want to do here. What I want to start with now is what I told you I was going to do, and that is come up with a formula that allows us to figure out what that critical force is where this member is going to want to start to buckle. Okay? And what this formula is called is Euler's buckling formula. Now, I've heard a lot of people pronounce this name a lot of different ways. I've heard Euler a lot. Okay? Um, and I won't necessarily get on anyone's case if they say it differently, but um, I have it on pretty good authority that this is supposed to be pronounced Euler. All right, so I'll, I'll pronounce it that way, um, but I figure I'd make mention of it. Let's say that we have a situation here that is just like the one I described, but this time, this one uh, we're going to get into in, in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's say, you know, as long as this rod stays straight, there's no ex reason that we would expect it to fail before it reaches its yielding stress, and yet I just showed you with my pair of pliers here, they practically do, right? They do fail before they reach their... Um, their uh, yielding strength. And the reason why is that nothing is ever exactly, perfectly, 100% totally straight, right? So, and as long as there's any sort of deviation of the strength of that material off of that line straight between where the two supports are, then something is going to have a, a tendency to want to buckle. So let's actually start this the way we do a lot of different things. Let's start with the idea that it you know, this buckling is beginning in this little member right here. So I'm showing it where we've loaded it up to that force of F where this buckling has just started to begin. Okay, you with me so far? Now let's actually define a coordinate system on this body. And this might be a little different than what we've done in the past, but there's a reason why I'm doing it this way. Let's put the coordinate system so that it's centered on the centroid of the cross section in the middle of this beam. Okay, so that'll be my x-axis, and this will be my y-axis. Okay, all right, so that's, you know, that's what we've got so far. Let me actually define a couple other things as well. Let me say that the um, line of action of these two forces right here, okay, and draw a little line like that, Let's say that this beam has deflected enough so that there's some finite amount of deflection right there. Okay, and let's give that amount of deflection the variable delta. Okay, so far so good. Now, what we're gonna have to do in order to, to derive this formula is we're gonna have to look and see what kind of bending moment is induced in the cross section of this beam, but we wanna do it as a function of where in the beam we are actually located along its length, okay? So let's go ahead and define a, uh, a variable here as a variable of, of x, okay? We kind of already have, have implied that with how I've set up my coordinates, but let's say I've got this variable of x, and that's how I'm gonna pick, a, pick out basically a particular cross section of this part, okay? Now, where I've picked out that cross section the centroid has risen very slightly because this thing is curved. Would you agree with that? Like there's a difference now where that centroid is located. So let me actually put that on here as this other axis. I know they're very close to each other, but let's say that what we're saying that is, right, is a coordinate of Y of the curve that this beam has taken on, right? This, it's got a little curve to it. And this Y is basically the Y coordinate of that point. Okay, and if I really want to get kind of picky on this, I could even call that y of x. Why do you think I can call it that? It's like a y is a function of x, right? Okay, that's because this curve, one of the things we're going to try to do right here is figure out what shape this curve is. And if I can figure out this function y is a function of x, that's one way to mathematically describe what this, uh, what this curve is shaped like. Okay, so this is kind of my starting point. What do you think I'm going to do at that location where I identified this x coordinate and y coordinate of the center of that beam? What do you think I might be up to here? Okay, I'll tell you what, let's make a cut right there. You're used to doing that in this class, right? We've always kind of identify a location where, make it, where we make a cut, and then we try to figure out what's going on at that cut. So let me, 
Um, look at that little cut right there. And it is going to kind of be still curving a little bit, okay, up to where this force is being applied. So I'm also blowing it up just a little bit there. So I've got this force of F acting here. Okay. What sorts of influences should I think about at this cut? All right. One of them is that there, we're going to have to react against this force of F, right? Would you agree that there's going to have to be a reaction against that force of F with an equal and opposite force of F? Okay. Now, there also might be a little bit of shear happening here, maybe, right? Um, that's not really the thing that I want to focus on mostly. What else do you think might be there that's, that's more of a concern to me? The moment, right? This F coupled with that F, right? They, those create this tendency to try to make it rotate counterclockwise, right? So there must be something acting here that tries to make it go back clockwise, Okay, and because we are going to kind of state all of this in terms of x, let me call that m as a function of x. That's what we're going to have going on right there at the cut. Okay, now let's put some dimensions on here because that's also part of doing a good free body diagram, right? So let's put a dimension here that uh, kind of tells us how high is this force F above the center of that cut, right? And based on the dimensions that I showed uh, originally over here, what is that length? Okay, the total length from X up to this top point up here is going to be what? Delta, right? And then the, the length from the X axis up to this Y coordinate is just that Y coordinate. So if I take the difference between those, that tells me how far it is from this line of one of the F's to the line of the other F, right? So that difference is just going to be equal to delta minus Y of X, right? That's kind of this length right here. Okay, so far so good. What else do I need to know maybe? I mean, maybe not anything, but uh, let's just put another thing on there just in case it matters to us. There's another length that we might care about over here. Okay, this length over here is going to be L over 2 minus X. Okay. All right, so... Who cares? Why would we do a free body diagram like this? You generally do free body diagrams so that you can do an equilibrium equation. Good job. So you're always you're typically doing a, uh, a free body diagram so that you can write an equation something like this. Summing moments around the cut, what will we end up with? Okay, we have the F acting at delta minus Y of X, right? So this will be F times delta minus Y as a function of X. What other influences do I have acting around the cut in a moment orientate or kind of in a moment way right there? Okay, M of X going clockwise, right? All right, anything else? That looks like it to me. So that's gonna be equal to zero. I can solve this for M of X. Okay, it is just going to be equal to F times delta minus Y of X, like that. Okay. So what, right? What does that do for us? Okay, we do need to find y of x. The problem is we don't know it yet, right? So we need to try to think about what we could do to find y of x. And we do have one other principle, one other sort of uh, relationship that we have established in here before, 
back when we were looking at beam deflection. Okay? We found a relationship between m of x, okay, so I'm going to put here recall, m of x was what? You remember what, uh, what this was? It was going to be equal to ei times what? Uh-oh, here comes some calculus, okay? Second derivative of y with respect to x, where y is the curve, right? Which is, that's exactly how we've got this set up, is as the curve, right? So this, this moment is related to that curve, okay? Um, well, we can do a substitution there, right? We can actually substitute m of x back into this equation right here. Um, and when we do, uh, here's what we will have, right? EI times the second derivative of y with respect to x is going to be equal to f times delta minus y of x. And furthermore, there's actually a little bit more that I can do with this uh, equation right here. I'm going to divide through by EI, and I'm also going to try to get everything that I have that has y of x in it, or any derivative of y of x, all on one side of the equation. Okay, So when I do that, here's what I end up with. Right? I've got a uh, second derivative of y with respect to x. Okay, It's going to be that plus f over EI times y of x, okay, which by the way, the y that I have up here is also y of x. I don't want you to get confused on that, but that's also y of x. I just kind of use the shorthand there, dy dx, okay? Um, and then what? What have I not written down here yet? Okay, this is going to be equal to f delta over EI. Okay, now some of you are, uh, are likely either finished with or in a differential equations class, but many of you are not, and that's okay. You don't need to be, all right? So for those of you who are uh, kind of familiar with some differential equations uh, techniques, this is going to be, you know, somewhat old hat. Otherwise, it'll be a nice little preview for some of the things that you're going to do when you're in differential equations, and I promise you that basically our conclusion is something where you don't need to necessarily know how to do a lot of differential equations, but I'm going to explain why we're doing what we're doing here in just a second. So this is a differential equation, okay? It's, a, it's called a second order differential equation, dy dx. And one of the techniques that you're going to see whenever you study differential equations is there are certain forms of differential equations where uh, the, the solutions to them are well known. And so what you do is you just start by assuming the form of what the solution might look like, and then you go back in and you try to you know, fill in all the details on the form of that solution, okay? And um, you, know, you may or may not cover in some of those classes where those forms came from in the first place, but that is a very common method to deal with differential equations, is to just say, well, when I see something that's of this form of a differential equation, the solution to it looks like something of this form. Okay, so that's what I'm going to show you here right now is the form of this equation that you can expect it will have when you are, you know, the form of the solution of the equation given this is what the form of the uh, original differential equation looks like. And here's what it is. Y of x is going to be equal to A, where A is a constant we have to determine, times uh, the sine of another constant, I'm going to call it omega, there's different letters that are sometimes used for that, uh, times x, okay, omega there is another one of our constants we're going to have to find, plus b times the cosine of omega x, okay, plus c, okay, and you know, I know this is kind of coming in from nowhere, right? Because I'm just, I'm just telling you that this is one of the, the techniques that's done to solve differential equations is 
you look at it and you say, okay, this is a second order differential equation that has this term on one side that's, that doesn't have any function of x in it, and we also have another term that has just the function itself. And so, you know, I just happen to know somehow that this is the form of the solution to that equation. Okay? So I'm sorry that that's kind of how that works. Um, it might not be much different when you get to your differential equations class, to be honest with you. Okay? So there it is. So what do we do with it, though? Can I take the derivative of that where, you know, I assume A, omega, B, and C are all constants, right? So those are, those are constants we're supposed to be trying to find. Can I take the derivative of that? What if I take the first derivative, what would it look like? Okay, for the first term right there, it's basically, you know, the A is just a constant, but keep in mind when you take the derivative of the sine right there, it's going, you have to take that constant that x is multiplied by and multiply it out in front. So we'll have omega times the sine of omega x. Okay? Oop, and I shouldn't have put sine there. What should I have put? Cosine. I would have many calculus teachers ashamed of me just now. Okay? What about my next term? Minus, minus now, because if you take the derivative of cosine, it's minus sine, right? So minus b times omega times the sine of omega x. Okay? What about c? It's a constant, so it goes away in this, in this derivative. Okay? So there's what my uh, first derivative looks like of y with respect to x. But what do I have in this formula up here? Okay, I've got the second derivative. So let me take another derivative of this thing. So the second derivative of y with respect to x is going to be equal to what? Okay, here I'm going to have minus a times what? Okay, omega squared, because we have another omega that pops out of that, you know, derivative of that cosine, uh, times the sine of omega x, okay? Over here, when I take the derivative of sine, it's just cosine without a sine change, right? So that I keep the negative sign right there, b times omega squared times the cosine of omega x, okay? So here's what's interesting. I now have an expression that gives me y of x, that's what I have right here, right? I also have this other expression for the second derivative with respect to x. What do you think I might be able to do with respect to my original equation? Yeah, we can plug them in, right? So what we have there is minus a omega squared times the sine of omega x minus b times omega squared times the cosine of omega x, okay, plus f over ei times y of x, and y of x is just a times the sine of omega x, okay, plus b times the cosine of omega x, right? Did I get all that in there correctly? Oh, I missed one. What did I miss? It is important, okay, as plus c's tend to be. Okay, and what does all this equal? Okay. The other side doesn't change. We still have just F delta over EI. What a mess. Okay. Here's my next question. Is there any way I can sort of collect some terms and make that cleaner? Okay. 
I can, right? So if you look at this, I've got this um, omega squared that exists on these terms right here, right? Um, along with A and B, whereas over here I just have A and B on those terms with uh, sine omega squared, or excuse me, sine omega x and then cosine omega x. Let me propose this. What if I go to a new line here and I say, what if I factor out an omega squared in uh, the, the sine omega x and cosine omega x over there on the left side, and I also factor out uh, on the right side an f over ei? That looks like what is going to be multiplied by the uh, quantity here of A times the sine of omega x uh, plus B times the cosine of omega x. Right? Um, all right, so, so, so far so good. What's next? plus the piece that I haven't dealt with yet is this FC over EI. And then of course, this is still equal to F delta over EI. All right, so here's another thing about the way differential equations work. They have to be true regardless of what X is, right? In other words, this, no matter what X is, this equation has to work. Right, or else my differential equation isn't valid, or my solution to it isn't valid. So we're, we're going to assume that it doesn't matter what x is. For every x, this has to work. And if that's the case, then the fact that we have something as a function of x over here, right, and nothing that's a function of x over here, means that these two terms must satisfy sort of each other. In other words, one of those terms has to be implying the other. And it means that all of this whole term over here on the left must be zero, because there's nothing over on the right that is also a function of x. Does that make sense? So all of this stuff over on the left somehow has to be zero, and it has to be zero no matter what x is, right? Um, and then over here on the right, um, these two terms have to end up being equivalent to each other in order for this to always be true no matter what x is. Okay, so what do, we, what do we sort of conclude from that? I guess I'll do the easy one first, right? This basically says that fc over ei has to be equal to f delta over ei. And what does that mean? By the way, you know, we're assuming f is not zero, e is not zero, and i is not zero, right? So none of those are zero quantities, and they are the same on both sides of this expression. So that basically means c has to equal delta. So we found one of our constants for our general form of this solution to this differential equation. OK, well, that's good. What about on the left side? Okay. What's, what's my method that I need to use maybe to, you know, to make sure that the left side is going to, you know, this, all these terms over here on the left that I identified right there, that those have to, you know, become zero. Yeah, exactly. So someone said this term right here has to be zero. And so omega squared has to be equal to F over EI. Right? So that's another thing that we're going to identify right there is that omega squared has to be equal to F over EI, which also implies, I'll go ahead and write it down here, this also implies that omega had better equal to the square root of F over EI. Technically, it probably should be plus or minus the square root. I'm just going to leave it as the square root right there because that's going to be good enough for what we're going to do later. Okay. Good stuff so far. What else do we need to deal with? A and B. A and B. Okay. So to get A and B, we actually need to bring to bear a couple of more principles that uh, we haven't looked at yet. And the principles that we have to use are things that we know about the original beam or the original, you know, if you want a fancy word to call this thing, sometimes it's called a column, right? It's designed to carry a... Uh, a compressive stress, and sometimes those are referred to as columns. 
But anyway, do we know anything um, about the curve, kind of the curve that this beam takes on when it begins to be loaded on the ends? It's smiley, right? Although I could have just as easily drawn it the other way and kind of changed some signs around on some of my variables. It doesn't really matter necessarily that it's smiley. Okay, look right in the middle of this beam and think about symmetry. Is there any reason that the le to the left of my y-axis should be a different shape than to the right of my y-axis? Okay, if there shouldn't be a different shape to either side, there's a couple things we can basically conclude there, actually one particular thing we can conclude there, and it's that there must be zero slope right there where it goes by. If it's gonna be the same on both sides and, and you're not gonna have like an instantaneous change in slope of this beam, it's gotta have zero slope right there where it goes through the middle of the beam, okay? So that's one principle that we can bring to bear on this is that at x equals zero, dy dx is also equal zero. Okay? Do we know any other relationships that might be kind of similar to that um, that we might be able to look at this figure and see? How did I set up my axes to begin with? I set them up so that they're basically riding with the middle of this beam. They're attached at the middle of the beam. So how much y deflection do I have at x equals zero? I set it up to be zero, right? I set it up so that my axes are actually centered at that point, right? And because I set it up to be zero, that means that I can say this, at x equals zero, okay? I can put it this way if I want to, y of zero is also equal to zero. Okay? Well, so what? How does that help me? Yeah, exactly. So let me actually do the, just the plain y first, right? I had this equation up here for the form of y of x, right? Let me copy that. Put it down here, okay? And what we're saying here is that y at an x of zero is equal all this stuff, and it has to be equal to zero, right? And what do I have to put in here? If I set equals, uh, x equals zero, what do I need to do? These are zero, all right? Well, what is the sign of zero? What's the cosine of zero? All right. So that might be kind of handy. Do I know any of my other variables that I have in, in this expression? OK. C is delta. OK. So what does this tell me? B is negative delta. All right. So that's, that might be kind of handy. All right, and it's also, by the way, um, equal to minus C, in case that's you know useful, because C was delta, right? Okay, cool. What do I need to do with my next move? Sure. Yeah. Let me do something similar, but go up here and grab this expression that I did for my first derivative, right, and plug that right here. All right, and we're saying that this derivative at x equals zero is equal all this stuff, and it has to be equal zero, and we need to replace anywhere where I've got the x there, I've got to get rid of that and just plug in zero. Okay, and how does that help me? Okay, first of all, sine zero is what? zero, cosine zero is one. Do I know anything about a or omega yet? 
Yeah, I know omega is the square root of f over ei, right? All right. So um, he says, but it has to be, it can't be zero, right? This omega uh, is equal to the square root of f over ei, and we're assuming none of those variables are zero, right? And so his point is, in order for this thing to be equal to zero, a has to be zero. All right. Well, that looks like that might be helpful. Um, what do I do now? Remember, I still have this y of x equation that I'm, I'm trying to basically generate this y of x equation, including all of its constants, right? Can I do that now? OK. Basically, this whole first term goes away because a was 0. Right? So I get rid of that one. Then what? C was C negative delta or delta? Delta. And B is negative delta. And what's omega? OK. And so what we end up with here is that our uh, curve of this beam can be described with this function, OK? Um, and I'm going to maybe simplify this just a little bit. We're going to say it can be simplified to delta times 1 minus cosine of what? Square root of f over ei times x. Okay. And this is interesting because this, you remember how we came up with elastic curves when we were doing beam deflection? This is basically that same idea. All right. This is the shape of that buckling rod. Or column. All right. But that only gets us so far. Right. What was I trying to come up with? This is interesting, right? This is a good result that we came up with along the way. What was I trying to get to, though? Yeah, but what we see as far as behavior is that it withstands the force just fine right up to a point, and then it buckles. And that's what we're trying to find is that force right then when it buckles. OK? So you know, how do we, how do we go about trying to think of that? Well, this one's a little bit harder, but you know, I would say there is actually another boundary condition. By the way, these things that we did up here where we looked at the slope uh, at x equals 0 or the amount of deflection at x equals 0, those are called boundary conditions. And we do actually have one more of these boundary conditions. Okay? Look at this figure that I've got right here. Do we know y of x at any other x locations? Before we even have done anything, are there any other spots where we know what y of x is in terms of our other um, kind of variables that we've established here? Y of x is delta. Yeah, y of x at, OK. Yeah, and so let's actually put something on here because I, I didn't necessarily even define this yet. Let's say that the whole length of this thing is L. I can't remember if I had that on the original picture or not, but let's say the whole length of it is L, right? That means that at L over 2, at x equal L over 2, we know that y has to be delta, right? So let's go ahead and put that condition down here. y at L over 2 has to be equal delta, right? And it has to be equal to delta times 1 minus the cosine okay, of the square root of f over ei times x. This has to be true at what x? Yeah, this has to be true at L over 2. How's the only, like, what's the only way that that can be true? 
yeah, this term, someone says the cosine here, this term right here has to be equal to 0 in order for this to work. OK, yeah, so this basically says the cosine of um, square root of f over ei times l over 2 has to be equal 0. What's the only place that cosine is equal 0? OK, technically, there's a lot of places where cosine function goes to 0 right? Here's what they are, right? F, this is basically the argument inside of there, square root of f over ei, right, times l over 2, has to be either pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, and so on. Those are all the solutions that you have for that formula, okay? Now let me ask you this. We're trying to find the smallest force that it takes to buckle this rod. Based on that equation you see right there, what's the smallest force? Keep in mind, L is basically going to be set by whatever your length is of your, beam, of your rod, right? E and I are just set by what the cross section is and what the material is, right? So the only thing that's sort of variable here that could get you to one of these solutions is f. So what's the smallest one? Let me ask this. Are these numbers over here increasing or decreasing as you go that way? So which one of these solutions gives you the smallest f that it would take to buckle this thing? The pi over 2 one, right? Now, you know, so I'll go ahead and write that down right here. Basically, this says that when... Um, you have your f over ei, square root of that, times l over 2, equal to pi over 2. This is the critical buckling load that it takes to, to buckle the thing. And we can actually solve that out um, in, if we want and get f all by itself. And by the way, in a lot of texts, they sometimes put a little subscript on here, something like, crit or critical or CR, I think, is in our textbook. But this is the critical buckling load. And if we kind of rearrange all of this, it ends up being pi squared EI over L squared. All right? And what we just came up with there, this is called Euler's buckling formula. And it sure is good to know, right? It's pretty cool that it comes out to be something that simple. Um, I, I skipped over something that I was going to make mention of back when we were looking at all these different solutions that we could have for F. So these are all going to come up with different amounts of force that are all going to be higher than this critical buckling load right here. But do they mean anything? Like, do those solutions mean something? OK. I'm going to tell you, they actually do, and it's actually really neat, right? The, the way that these little pieces buckled that I just showed you, how did they buckle, did it look like? Okay, basically one curve, right, kind of curved in one spot in order to make that shape, right? What if I had stabilized the very center of that rod so that it wasn't allowed to move? and then squeezed it with my pliers. It would buckle twice. What force do you think it would take to make it buckle in those two spots? Like doing, you know, pushing it together like this, if it buckles in two spots, the force it takes to do that is this term right here. What do you think the next solution is? Yeah, you end up with three spots that it buckles. These are called different mode shapes 
of the way that this thing might be able to buckle, right? And that's, that's a pretty cool outcome. Each one that you, each place that you support it to try to make it more stable, it gives rise to the idea that there might be a different shape that it would try to buckle in, right? And it would take more force to do that, to make it buckle in this other shape, but it could still buckle, right? Right, so his question is, if we just figure out every solution to this, those are kind of how much force it would take to get to the next mode of buckling, right? You get to the next one of these solutions, that's how much it takes to get to that next mode of buckling. Isn't that pretty slick? All right, so a couple of finer points here because Euler's buckling formula is really good for us to know, but we need to actually like bring it to bear on something real, all right? Before I do that though, there's two other little points I wanna make about this and then I'll do an example problem, okay? So, here's one of them. Um, we already had a way to try to figure out when short compressive members were gonna fail. We basically said you take the force applied to the member, divide it by the area over which it's applied. As long as that's less than or equal to your allowable stress, we say, we're probably not gonna fail, right? If you get over that level, then it, it is likely to fail, right? What we just came up with was a, a, another formula for long compressive members. And for these long compressive members, uh, we're basically saying that as long as you keep your force less than this critical force, which you can compute with Euler's buckling formula, then we're probably not likely to buckle there, okay? What about if you've got something somewhere between a short compressive member and something that's a long compressive member, and maybe another way to ask this question is, what do we even mean by the two? What do we mean by short versus what do we mean by long? Okay, and um, so I'm gonna answer that in, in kind of a, a little bit of a shorter way here and say, I'm going to save this idea of somewhere between these two for a little bit later time. Right? And we're going to cover in that other lecture uh, at some point um, the idea of something called a slenderness ratio. Okay? So suffice to say right now that if you have something that's long and skinny, chances are it's going to buckle before it fails as just a compressive load, just like a compressive yielding. But if you have something that's short and fat, then it's more likely to fail just by compressive yielding. Um, in either of these cases, there's something else we can do as well we can apply some kind of a factor of safety, right? You, you kind of think about this allowable stress that we have right here. Very often what we do when we define an allowable stress is we take the stress that causes failure, something like yield, and you divide it by a factor of safety, right? What do you do in the case of these long compressive members? Yeah, so you might want to figure out what force would cause it to fail and then divide that by some kind of, uh, you know, I'll use this in, in a non-technical way, but put some kind of a factor of safety on that in order to make sure that, you, you know, you make this thing safe, right? Because you want to get, you don't necessarily get right up to that level that you think is going to buckle a member, okay? So that's my only other point that I'm going to make on that one. Um, and, you know, it's just eventually I'm going to get another lecture out there about what to do if you have something in between a short stubby, short fat member and something that's more of a long skinny one. Here's my other point I wanted to make on this slide. Okay. The problem that we solved for Euler's buckling formula is the one on the far left, right? It had pinned ends, meaning that we were doing nothing to support what the ends were doing. They were free to rotate on the two ends of that beam or that column that we did uh, when we derived Euler's buckling formula, okay? What happens if we fix both ends from rotation? Yeah, he says there's gonna be moments at each end that will try to stabilize it somewhat. How do we deal with that? Well, let me show you how to deal with that. It turns out that when you load a beam like this, Somewhere, you know, you might see here, this, this curves one way, and then at some point it starts curving the other way, right? What happens at that transition is called an inflection point, right? 
And if you figure out where those inflection points are, right, maybe there's one right in there somewhere, and maybe there's another one right in here somewhere, right? If you figure out what those inflection points are, it turns out that this middle portion right here has the same shape. We're not going to prove that, but that middle portion ends up with the same shape that we just derived that a pinned uh, connection has. And so what, what you can do to deal with a case of having two fixed ends is you can come up with something called an effective length. And uh, again, this is not something I'm going to prove, but it turns out that the length between these two uh, inflection points for a fixed end, fixed end type shape is just L over two. If the original was L, that length right there is gonna be L over two. And so it means that at the effective length of a fixed end, fixed end, fixed against rotation, right? Um, column like this is to, that it's basically like it's half the length of the original, okay? Now, what do you think for a, um, you know, the case of a free end like this where the other end is fixed? This is different because you're not even stabilizing it against like swaying left and right. You're just putting a load on the end of a completely free column that's sticking up in the air. Okay, so this is also kind of interesting in that this segment of this shape right here, right, actually has the same shape to it as half of this piece, kind of up to the middle right there. Those two pieces will end up with the same shape to them, okay? And so what we can conclude from that is you can kind of imagine this shape almost continuing on around, right? And the overall length of that would actually be two times the original length for the one that had pin dents. So the effective length then for that case is going to be two times L. All right? And then the last one's also kind of interesting, although it's even harder to kind of describe. But with the last one here, the shape that we're looking for is basically from where the pin is up to where this inflection point occurs, which is somewhere, somewhere kind of in there, right? So if I was to kind of take just this much of it, I might have to rotate it a little bit as well, but the essential shape of that piece between those two pieces is the same shape as we get with the uh, pinned end, pinned end, right? And uh, it turns out that that length is approximately 0.7 of the original length. Okay, and in all, you know, all these cases were kind of, you know, I guess not in all the cases, but in two of these cases, we were looking at where an inflection point occurred, and that's what sort of establishes where this uh, has an equivalent curve to the original Euler's buckling formula that we found. But the way we deal with it is that if we have one of these other kinds of ends, we basically replace the L in, buck in Euler's buckling formula with one of these effective lengths based on the end conditions that we actually have. Okay. Cool. Questions yet? Yes. Is there one for a pinned free? Um, let me see if anyone has a thought on that. Do you think there should there would be one for a pinned end and a free end? No. Okay. Why not? Yeah. It is. It does not have enough constraints to be stable. If you have a pinned end and a free end there aren't enough constraints to even hold it in equilibrium. So we don't have a version that's like that because we don't even have a way of holding a beam that's built that way in equilibrium. It's a good question though, because it's like, you see all the other combinations, why shouldn't there be that one? Well, that's why, it's because it's not in equilibrium. Okay, all right, let's go and do a problem. Okay, a nice little frame problem. Although it might not be as much of a frame problem as, as uh, it looks like at first. Okay, what it's asking us to do is to find the maximum force F that can be applied to this shelf kind of thing there at the end um, before member BC can be expected to fail. Now here's a couple of detailed points I'm gonna share with you. 
First of all, let's assume that the ends of member BC are reinforced with these little sleeves that are sort of welded onto the member itself. Why do you think I'm adding that as a little detail on telling you about this problem? Okay, if I didn't do that, what would happen at the ends of this thing? You'd have probably really high stresses right where? Like right where the pin interacted with the body. As a matter of fact, it's likely that those would be a lot higher stresses than would exist just in the middle of the rod somewhere. But what can I do by reinforcing it like this? Right? It doesn't take me very much material to reinforce it like this, and it basically makes my member such that if it fails just due to yielding stress, it's going to happen somewhere in the length of the member, not right there where the pin is, is contacting inside one of the holes. Right? So that's one of the reasons I give you this little piece of information. Let's presume that whoever reinforced the ends um, did it adequately enough so that if it fails, it's going to fail somewhere in the middle of the member. Okay? Let's also add another constraint here and say that the pins at B and at C, basically, let's say that those stay rigid. Okay? What does that do for me? What if they didn't stay rigid? That's a good question to ask. What if they didn't stay rigid? Would, could that have a possibility of inducing a moment in the member if the, the pins on the end were, let's say, you know, they're sticking out at you, but let's say elasticity in the rest of this uh, member right here causes those to start, you know, trying to rotate. What would that do to the tendency of this thing to want to buckle? That'd be a bad thing, right? That would actually probably induce buckling more quickly if it wasn't kept perfectly rigid um, in terms of rotation at B and at C. But let's say that it is. Let's say that this thing is stiff enough that those stay rigid. And these are questions like if you're a designer designing this thing, you actually have to evaluate that and say, well, is it rigid, right, for the real one that I'm doing? Do I need to do something else to make it more rigid? That kind of stuff, right? But let's say that it's rigid for this question. All right, so I already mentioned like one of the ways that it might fail, and that is what? Yielding stress due to just this compressive force. How do I figure out how much uh, force might exist in member BC right when it's on the verge of failing in compression? Failing as due to compressive stress. Okay, well, what's a piece of info that I have here? Yeah, he says, I'm given what kind of material this is, and in this course, we've got these, this little nice little table that if we're given the name of this kind of material, we can go and look up what we can expect the strength for that material to be. Okay, all right, so I'm going to report to you what the yielding strength is of a structural steel. Okay, it's going to be 250 MPA. All right, and uh, if any of you are kind of looking in the table, another one to maybe look up at the same time might be what? Think of Euler's buckling formula, and we're probably going to need that here in a few minutes. Elasticity, right? Modulus of elasticity. And so modulus of elasticity for a structural steel is reported in that table as being 200 GPA. Okay, cool. Um, so those are some things that we might need to know. How do I use um, you know, either of these to figure out um, the force that I can expect member BC to be able to carry before it fails in compression? Okay, basically 250 MPA is my limit, right? So I take that, right? So maybe I'll put a heading on here. Um, you know, yielding and compression. All right, and so I'll take 250 MPA, and I'll set that equal to the force in member BC. I'll call that FBC, divided by what? 10 millimeters 
I, I need to basically take the cross-sectional area of BC, right? 10 millimeters times, this is the cross-section over here, right? 10 millimeters wide by 15 millimeters high, right? Okay, and once I plug those in and I basically take 250 MPA, you multiply that by 10 millimeters times 15 millimeters. What kind of units is that going to give me? Okay, you remember me running through, through some of these units here earlier where an MPA is equal to a Newton per square millimeter. That means that when I multiply these out, it's going to give me Newtons, right? So FBC is going to be equal to, I'll just report it to you here. I, I don't necessarily need to do that calculation, I don't think. 37.5 kilonewtons, it'd be 37,500, right, kil, uh, newtons. Okay, let me put it down here. Which is 37.5 kilonewtons if you want to report it that way. Okay, so this is good because it'll start failing as in yielding if we get up to that force FBC. And if I want, at this point, I could uh, figure out what that would imply as far as how much force acts on the tip of this shelf. But is that an efficient way to do this problem? Because what are the other failure modes that could happen? All right, this whole lecture is about buckling, right? And so maybe this thing will buckle, not just fail by yielding and compression. If it buckles, are there more than one way it can buckle? Like in this case, I had these round pieces that I was, I was pressing. Could I maybe on those, it, is it possible for me to tell what direction it's going to go before I start squeezing it? It's actually kind of hard to tell what direction it's going to buckle when I start squeezing this. What if I took a ruler, and I should have grabbed one before I got here, but what if I took a ruler and pressed it down? Do you know what direction it's going to buckle when you start pushing on it? About the weakest axis, right? You look at which axis will flex the easiest, right? And that's the direction it's going to buckle. All right, so for this problem, can we look at it and tell what direction it's going to buckle? Yes and no, right? When you look at it, you say, well, if I look at it from the standpoint of the piece could, you know, buckle out to where it maybe took on a shape, something like this, right? In plane, right? In this plane that I'm showing it to you, it could buckle out to the side. Is that the stronger axis or the weaker axis? That's the stronger axis because if it goes around, if it starts flexing that direction, it's flexing around an axis that goes through this cross section this way, right? What's the other way it could flex? Kind of out toward us or into the page is the other direction it could flex. If it flexes that direction, what way, which way is it bending? It'll be bending around this axis, right? If it goes that direction. So you might look at it and go, well, which of those two directions is it going to be weaker? Ah, so he's got another point here. So I thought we had pins at B and C. I thought they were rigid, right? Well, they are rigid against rotations, right, around a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. But they are not rigid around an axis that kind of comes in and out of the page, right? They allow rotation that direction because that's how pins work. But it d will not allow rotations um, around an axis this way or an axis this way, right? It won't allow rotations in those directions. So how do we use that information? 
does that mean that it can't buckle into the page or out of the page? What if I made it paper thin? Would it be able to buckle into the page or out of the page? Okay. Even though pins B and C will hold themselves rigid and not allow rotation at B and C around those two axes that I just identified, right? It could still buckle, but what is going to be the mode shape? I guess I shouldn't say it that way because mode shape is kind of different. What would be the shape based on our different end conditions that I just uh, showed you a few minutes ago? Yeah, it'll be more like the fixed fixed version because the two ends will not be allowed to rotate if it moves in that direction. So we have two things we have to evaluate because in one case we've got a stronger cross section but free to rotate on the ends. And in the other direction, we're not free to rotate on the ends, but a weaker cross section. So either one could be my worst case, and I have to evaluate both of them. All right, which one do you want to do first? No one has, a, has an opinion? Let's just do the kind of the in-plane one first, the one that I drew, like that shape that this thing could start taking on and uh, moving away from its original axis there. If I do that one, then basically I've got, um, I would say maybe um, uh, in-plane buckling might be a way I could describe that. Okay, and what's my um, formula gonna be for figuring out FBC? The critical force kind of the maximum it can carry for FBC before it buckles. What's Euler's buckling formula? Okay, that's what I'm going to need to use here. And in that plane, right, the in-plane movement of this of this uh, buckling thing, it has pinned ends in that case, and so it's going to be just straight up application of Euler's buckling formula. So I have to plug in my values that I need to do, right? Pi, what's E? Oh, pi squared, I should say. Yeah, 200 GPA. Okay, that would be 200 times 10 to the 6th, not 10 to the 6th, times 10 to the 9th, what? Okay, Newton per square meter. Okay, then what? What I value, how would I calculate that? Okay, it's rectangular, and the second moment of area about the centroidal axis for a rectangle is, the formula for that is bh cubed over 12, right? Which one is b? Yeah, in this case, it's going to be 10 millimeters. Okay. Um, H is going to be 15 millimeters. And that would be cubed, not squared. Give myself a little more room here. Okay. And what do I put in the denominator? Okay, yeah, so BC right here is going to be in some kind of units like centimeters, right? Shall we figure out what that length BC is real quick? BC is going to be equal to the square root of 48 centimeters squared plus 20 centimeters squared. Okay. And uh, just by accident, that turns out to be a nice clean number, 52 centimeters. Exactly. No one saw that coming. Okay, so that's my, um, that's my length BC, and that is what I can plug in 
for the denominator down here, 52 centimeters squared. Now there's some units to deal with here, right? What should I deal with for my units? What should I do? Okay, up in the numerator up here, I've got millimeters to the fourth, and in the denominator, I've got centimeters squared, right? So one way of dealing with this is to just put, you know, 100 centimeters in a meter and square that like that. And in the numerator, I could say that there's 1,000 millimeters in a meter. And I could... Yes, sorry, I, sh I forgot my 12. Someone reminded me that I'm supposed to have a 12 down here. Um, tell you what, let me, let me rewrite this a little bit because I put my 52 centimeters in a funny place there. Thank you. Let me put 12 down here and then I'll put 52 centimeters squared down here. And I'll put that factor where it's obvious what I'm doing. Okay. Thank you for reminding me about my factor of 12 there on my BH cubed over 12. All right. Well, I don't really have the heart to necessarily punch that into my calculator, and I'm pretty sure all of you can do that. And so let me go ahead and report to you what this turns out to be. Okay. Um, this turns out to be uh, 20.531. <clears throat> kilonewtons. Okay. Is that less than or more than we had in the case of just yielding strength, yielding stress? Okay. That's less. So which one will happen first? This one we just found. So it's going to buckle here before it reaches its uh, yielding strength for that material, okay? But we have, to probably, we have to probably check this other one as well because it might not buckle in that plane. It might buckle in and out of the page. So how do we do that? I'll label this one out of plane buckling. Okay. What changes? Okay, we still have pi. Squared, we still have 200 times 10 to the ninth Newtons per square meter. Okay, um, does our I change? Okay, let me not forget my over 12 here. I'll do that very first thing. Um, what changes here is that we reverse which of these is the base and which of them is the height in our BH cubed, um, and that was supposed to be millimeters, in our BH cubed over 12. Right? Keep in mind, we also need to make sure these units jive. So we'll put meters over 1,000 millimeters and take that to the fourth. In the denominator, what do we need to do? Right, so what we do there is the effective length is now going to be half, right? Well, I was going to pull up that. It's not pulling up, but anyway, it's going to be half of the... Um, you know, the actual length of it is going to be the effective length of it, right? So what I do is I take 0.5 times the actual length of 52 centimeters, and I square that. Okay, and again, if we want to make sure those units jive, we want to do a conversion here to go back to uh, base units there, and then that would be squared. 
right? And again, I'm confident all of you can punch that in a calculator and get the correct answer. I hope you prove me right next time we have an exam. FBC ends up being, for this case, 36.5 kilonewtons. So which direction is it more likely to buckle? In plane, right? It's, it would stay in this plane, right, and just sort of move upward like this. Okay. The only reason for that is that the end supports, those pins on the ends, we're assuming they're rigid, they are providing some support that uh, make it to where the effective length is much shorter for the out of plane direction. Yeah. Those are, th his question is, does it matter if it buckles toward the other members or away from the other members? Um, for a problem like this, that's probably going to be unpredictable which direction it would go. And the answer is no, it doesn't really matter, right? Because we, we found what that critical buckling load is. Now, I could, I could make an argument that would say there might be a slight influence that would make it want to buckle downward. Because if it's under the influence of gravity, then maybe there's some kind of a small amount of force that's tending to try to push it downward anyway, right? But we aren't given any information about that when this problem was stated to us, so you know we, we wouldn't necessarily just assume that. But it doesn't really matter, right? It, either direction it goes, the critical buckling load is going to be the same. All right. So, but the question asked: Find the maximum force F that can be applied before member B BC can be expected to fail. How do I find that? Okay, let me actually give myself some space right here. <clears throat> right, what I need to do to figure that out is a little free body diagram, right? Because what I just figured out was what the maximum actual compressive force is that I can put in BC. How does that interact with member AB? Okay, and do a little free body diagram here and say, I've got my reactions here at A. I've got another reaction that I just figured out at B. Right, that reaction, at least the maximum I can expect out of BC is going to be what? 20.531 kilonewtons. And then I've got my force of F that I'm trying to find out here. What else do I need on this free body diagram to make it useful? Some lengths, maybe? 48 centimeters to here. And what other length? OK, it's 22 more centimeters. to F. What about the slope of this? Okay, it'll have a rise of 20 for a run of 48. Right? Anything else I need to know here? I mean, I could put some axes on there if I wanted. What do I do with this diagram? Okay. For this 20.531 kilonewton force, it's going to have one component that goes up like this and one component that goes here, right? Between those two components, do both of them apply moments around A? Only the vertical component, right? So I need to pick off just the vertical component, and it's going to create a counterclockwise tendency to rotate around A, right? So I'm going to take that as a positive. 20.531 kilonewtons, okay, multiplied by what? 20 over, I could do the square root of 48 squared plus 20 squared, but I already did that calculation and I figured out it was 52. 
right? What else? Times 48 centimeters. Okay. That is how much uh, counterclockwise rotational influence happens due to the 20.531 kilonewton around point A. What else has a rotational influence around point A? F, right? It has a clockwise tendency, right? So F, and what, it's, what is its length from its line of action away from point A? Okay, yeah, 48 centimeters plus 22 centimeters gives me 70 centimeters. Okay, and so if you plug all this in, um, what you end up getting for F is 5.415. kilonewtons. So that's a, the maximum force we can put on this little shelf before we buckle member BC or fail B, member BC in any kind of way that it, we are aware of that it might fail. Okay. And it's a lot less, significantly less, maybe a lot might be too big of a statement there, but it's significantly less than what it would have been if we had just calculated it based on yielding strength. Okay. Now, many of you might be getting ready to do a uh, truss design. This is incredibly poignant and pertinent information, right, for when you are designing trusses. Why? Some of your members in trusses will be in tension, but others will be in compression. And so when you're designing a truss, very many of your members in a truss uh, are, are likely not necessarily to fail just due to yielding. They're likely to fail instead maybe due to some, some buckling action. Okay. Um, you do have to sort of think carefully about what your end conditions are in a truss, right? Generally, you're going to have one, di one direction at least where you assume that there's going to be pins, right? But then in the other directions, how they really behave depends a lot on how those are actually built, right? Like whether or not you actually provide any support laterally, uh, like we did in this problem, is kind of a function of, of exactly how those pins um, are actually constructed. All right. Last minute questions. Okay, his question was, why did I use this value, this 20.531 kilonewtons, as the force right here? The reason why we did that is when you look down here, we found three different amounts of force that could fail that member BC, right? One of them happens before the others, right? And the one that happens at the lowest level is going to be the one that controls when it ultimately will collapse, right? And it turns out that the buckling in plane is the one that happens first. So we can't expect that it will reach any of those other forces because it will fail this way first. All right. Good question. Other, other questions? All right. Thank you for your attention. I'll see you next time.